Down the long path of history, trampling across centuries and continents, and the graves of kings and the necks of dictators, seeking always a way of life where the people have their freedom, believing, praying, fighting, dying, we came this way. The NBC University of the Air, a public service feature of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations, presents We Came This Way, a new historical series for our listeners at home and overseas. With Clifton Utley as narrator, we present Chapter 6, the story of Giuseppe Garibaldi, the hero of two worlds in We Came This Way. There's a flame that has been burning a thousand years, or maybe a thousand thousand, and no one has ever been able to put it out. Kings and emperors and tyrants and despots and demagogues and dictators have tried to extinguish it. It burns more fiercely today than ever before. It burned in the souls of the men who went to Spain to fight on the side of the loyalists in 1936. It burned in the men who joined the Chinese when they stood alone against the Japanese. It burned in Benito Juarez, in Kosciuszko, in Lafayette, in George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, and in the souls of millions who, except to God, shall be forever nameless. And it burned in the soul of Giuseppe Garibaldi. <laughs> He's an outlaw and a cutthroat. He's a pirate. Those who follow him are the dregs of the human race. He's an oily tongued politician, if that's what you mean, but uh, Garibaldi is no blacker. That's the way they were talking about Garibaldi in the diplomatic circles of Europe in 1860. He's raised a rabble of a thousand bandits and has stayed out of Genoa to intervene in the Sicilies, has he not? And under whose authority? He is an anarchist. The people of the Sicilies, as the island of Sicily and the lower part of Italy were called in those days, had risen against their Bourbon rulers. In 1860, Italy was a house divided against itself. Some parts were ruled by Austria, some by the Pope, and some by local princes. For half a century, the people of the Sicilies had suffered oppression under the Bourbons. They had been deprived not only of their civil rights, but also of their human rights. Why was not Garibaldi stopped? He sailed with his ships out of Genoa in sight of everyone. Everyone knows he's a desperado. The Sicilians have every right to help. I say he should be stopped. But the rule of the Bourbons in the Sicilies is degenerate. By what right does he dare intervene? Fortunately, there's a regular force of more than 20,000 troops on the island of Sicily to face him. And many more on the mainland. Ah, he has been a notorious rebel all his life. Rebel. Mark that word. And mark who said it. A Prussian minister representing one of the most autocratic royal courts of Europe. In Garibaldi, he saw danger. In Garibaldi, he recognized that eternal something which since the beginning of history has inspired men to rise against oppression. If dreaming of freedom is being a rebel, then Garibaldi was a rebel. Italy can be redeemed. He said that when he was 27 years old. He was a sea captain ashore at Taganrog, Russia, on the Black Sea. If we can rouse the spirit of young Italy, then unity and liberty are ours. Over coffee cups in a tawdry cafe in Taganrog, he and a young Genoese named Cuneo planned their part in the coming Mazzini uprising in Italy. Garibaldi, understanding the sea, would undertake to win over the malcontents in the fleet at Genoa. Giuseppe, uh, walk with me, Cuneo. Soldiers are following me. What fortune did you have? None. Do not look back. Do they know why you are here? They suspect. Will the men of the fleet join us? No. They feel as we do, but they will not rise. The soldiers are gaining on us. Do not hurt. At the next corner, you will turn to the left. I will turn to the right. Agree? Agree. Genoa was alert with soldiering. Martini's invasion had failed. Garibaldi coolly walked through the streets to the home of a fruit seller. 
dressed as a peasant woman, he made his way out of Genoa to Nice, from there to Marseille. And there, for the first time, he saw his name in the newspaper. Giuseppe Garibaldi, who was implicated as one of the leaders of the abortive uprising, has been outlawed from Italy and condemned to be shot. The warrant was signed by Charles Albert, King of Sardinia. Garibaldi shipped out of Marseille as a seaman under the name of Giuseppe Panne. For two years, he dodged from port to port, barely eluding the agents of Charles Albert. In 1836, he sailed to South America, to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Why are you Italian to change? We are prisoners of the Portuguese. Why? Do not talk in front of the guard. Send back there! Send back! Garibaldi watched his countrymen being brought ashore under heavy guard from a Portuguese vessel. The province of Rio Grande do Sul was in rebellion against the Portuguese rule of Brazil, and the flame within Garibaldi blazed. In the New World, men were fighting oppression the same as in the old, and those who fought it were entamed, or, like him, were fugitives on pain of death. The Italian refugees who were not entamed, and the sympathizers with the new Republic of Rio Grande do Sul, provided him with a fishing vessel. We will fit it out as a privateer. We will arm it with all possible guns, and we will name it Massim. Garibaldi, with a handful of men with his nondescript vessel, sailed down the coast. Sail ho! Sail ho! The Maka of the Labour Sea! That is a coasting vessel. Overhaul it. Aye, sir. Make all sail! Vessel carried a cargo of coffee and other supplies. Gargo, Garibaldi captured it without difficulty. We will take this vessel in place of ours. Transfer all arms and supplies from the Martini to the Louise. Aye, sir. Make pass to the Louisa and transfer all arms and supplies from the Martini. They sunk the Martini. And with the flag of the new Republic of Rio Grande do Sul flying from the masthead of the Louisa, they sailed for the River Plata. Their enemy, the Empire of Brazil. Captain Garibaldi, two launches off the port bow. Garibaldi raised his long glass. They are flying no flags. Signal them. Aye, sir. Give them the signal of the Republic of Rio Grande do Sul. Aye, sir. They're not replying, Captain Garibaldi. Break the arms out of the chest and stand by for it. Aye, sir. Fight the arms! Aye, The two powerful launches bore down on the Louisa, their full size and armament now visible. Where there had been three men on each boat, suddenly there were 30, all heavily armed. The two Brazilian boats bore down the longsides and let go a fusillade against the Louisa. They're going to try to pour and press them down with your saber. Garibaldi lay unconscious on the deck for an hour while the battle raged. The Brazilian boats hauled off the beaches, their decks littered with dead. Aboard the Louisa, they were also dead, and many wounded. In his intervals of delirium, with the bullet in his neck, Garibaldi directed the navigation of the Louisa. Still greater trials lay ahead. Captain Garibaldi, we're taking water faster than we can pump it out. Have you furled all sail? The hurricane has carried away every stitch of sail we have. Captain Garibaldi! He's captured! The Louisa was lost. But Garibaldi would not die. In the thundering hurricane, he tried to save comrades floundering in the water with him. They sank before his eyes. With a few naked survivors, he reached the shore. Uh, you are Garibaldi. Oh, thank heaven you are saved. How goes the battle? We are marching on the port of Laguna. 
There's a Brazilian fleet at anchor in the lagoon. A Brazilian fleet? But we hope to capture the city anyway. I will bring you some food and clothes before I go on. We will go with you. With us? No, no. We you must are... not let the fleet escape. Come, my men. All of you. Oh, yeah. We will march on Laguna with the Republicans. Oh, yeah. and, Boston, Boston, and still bleeding, Garibaldi and his men joined the march. They stormed Laguna and took it. The Brazilian fleet surrendered, and Garibaldi became its commander. Aboard his flagship, the Itaparica, Garibaldi scanned the nearby hills with a long glass. Near the picturesque house, he spied a young woman. Through his glass, he watched her. She was great and beautiful and courage and all the other things that he had yearned for. Close the gig. I'm going ashore. Alone, he made his way to the house where he had seen her. The place was empty. He walked from house to house looking for her, but he found her nowhere. A native invited him to his house for coffee, and there she was. What is your name? Anita Ruben. I am Giuseppe Garibaldi. The fame of Garibaldi had spread throughout Brazil. She stood there, her heart throbbing in her throat, frankly surveying his extraordinary presence. A man of middle height, with broad shoulders and a square chest. A blonde, heavy mustache, a blonde beard ending in two points, and blonde, wavy hair hanging down to his shoulders. Blue eyes, changing like the evening sky to violet. Thoughts went racing through her head. He looks like a lion, a magnificent creature. In battle, she had heard, his eyes flashed and his blonde hair bristled like that of a lion. You should be mine. I am sure. But he knew, as well as he did, that henceforth they would belong to each other. He carried her off to his ship. They were married in Montevideo. They sent their honeymoon to sea, and together they committed their lives to the flame that burned within them both. Anita fought beside Garibaldi in sea battle after sea battle. And when Garibaldi left the sea to command the guerrilla band ashore, she rode with him. Sometimes they rode alone, sometimes with thousands. They carried their children with them on the road to their saddles. Sometimes they were separated, sometimes each brought the other there. Rio Grande de Zul is being overrun, my Anita. Our arms have been scattered. Have we lost? Our fight can never be lost. But we must leave Rio Grande de Sul. We must leave. Yes. We will go to Montevideo. But we shall never give up. Autocracy was riding high. But the flame that burned in Garibaldi burned in the souls of countless others in South America. The fight for Rio Grande de Sul was lost. But the cause of freedom and liberty and justice was not lost. In Montevideo, Garibaldi learned that the tyrants of Argentina were threatening Uruguay. And as he had committed his life to fighting of oppression wherever he found it, he took up the sword against Argentina. Garibaldi formed his famous Italian legion of Red Shirt. Italian patriots, adventurers, soldiers of fortune would come to South America to search for and fight for that freedom which to them was dearer than life itself. Inspiring Garibaldi. Red Shirt for blood and sacrifice and freedom. Not only that, a few men wearing red look like many men, especially on the battlefield. Yes. And the color of red dances in the rifle sights of the enemy and makes them miss. But uh, are they not more visible on the battlefield? Yes. But a soldier in a red shirt can either retreat or hide. And over Garibaldi's legion of red shirts floated a black flag with a volcano in the middle. It is the symbol of Italy, mourning with a sacred flame in her heart. At the head of the Italian legion, with Anita at his side, 
Garibaldi rode out to meet the enemy, who were driving on Montevideo with overwhelming force. Here we must pass, Amita Mia. We must go back to the village. <laughs> Children are in good hands in Montevideo. The enemy is closing in on us. My officers are waiting for me at San Antonio. You have stopped the enemy before at the gates of Montevideo. But this I time... I know, Giuseppe, but I am going with you. Anita! Please. Then, let us be going. General Gomez, with seven squadrons of cavalry and a corps of infantry twice the size of Garibaldi's force, bore down on the Italian legionnaires like a flood. The battle surged back and forth. Garibaldi waited for each attack, then counterattacked. When the fighting was done, Garibaldi's dead were buried in a common grave atop a hill overlooking the battlefield. And over the grave, Garibaldi raised a cross with the words, To the Italian Legion and the native Marine and Cavalry. Montevideo was saved. But now a greater duty called him home. Once again, his people were rising. Once again, the flame was blazing throughout Italy. Throughout the peninsula, the Italians were rising against their rulers. In Lombardy, Garibaldi raised an army of 3,000. With Anita at his side, he flung himself into the battle. The uprising was crushed, and Garibaldi had to flee to Switzerland. But now the flame had stirred all Italy. The Romans set up a government of their own, and word spread with the wind that Garibaldi was back. I demand the proclamation of a Roman Republic! <laughs> But hardly had the news reached Paris than a French army was sent against us. Street by street, Garibaldi defended Rome. General Garibaldi, a message. I have no time to read. But it is from the Constituent Assembly. The Assembly? Yes, yes, the members urgently require your presence at once. Garibaldi sprang to his horse, galloped across the Tiber, and with his face drenched with sweat, his clothes covered with dust and blood, presented himself to the Assembly of the new Roman Republic. Only three choices are open to us. To surrender, to die fighting in the streets, or to retreat to the mountains. We ask you, General Garibaldi, for your counsel. Surrender I will not discuss. To die uselessly in the streets is folly. We will retreat and take with us what is left of our government and army. Wherever we go, there Rome will be. Garibaldi walked out, mounted, and rode back to his men fighting in the streets. We must fight our way out of Rome and march into the wilderness. I offer you new battles and fresh glory. I can give you no pay, no rest, and food will have to be eaten when it can be found. Whosoever shrinks from these conditions, let him remain here in Rome and surrender. <laughs> Five thousand swore to follow him. Five thousand and Anita. Giuseppe Mio. We will come back, Anita. We will come back. Where you go, Giuseppe. There I will go. But Anita was failing. With one devoted friend, Garibaldi carried her aboard a boat. But Garibaldi's force was shattered, his boat wrecked. He reached shore, carrying Anita in his arms. As he carried her into the house of a peasant, she died. You must bury her. I must go on. Alone, Garibaldi pressed on into the night. All that he had hoped for and fought for were gone. His beloved Anita and the Roman Republic. His name was reviled. He traveled to Tunis and was turned out. He traveled to Gibraltar and was turned out. He sailed to America and found haven. In oblivion, he struggled as a workman. The flame flickered almost out, but it still burned. Give time to time. These were his words. He was not to see his beloved Italy again for five years. He sailed from New York to Lima, Peru, again became a sea captain, sailed to China, 
to Australia, to England, and at last to Italy. Give time to time. He bought the northern half of the little island of Caprera, off the coast of Sardinia, and there, with his motherless children, settled down, tended his goats, tilled the soil, and taught his children to read. Give time to time. The call came in 1860. The people of the Sicilies have risen against the Bourbon rule. They ask that you come and help them. Help them. I will. The time had come for Garibaldi to strike out against all kings and dictators. All that he had experienced in the years of his struggles now became priceless. His buccaneering off the coast of South America, his guerrilla warfare in the Pampas. While he fitted out a small flotilla of boats at Genoa, Italian statesmen appealed to King Victor Emmanuel to stop him. Let him go. We will not help. Officially, we know nothing of his wild folly. And if he should succeed, then we shall be in a position to act as we see best. With arms and ammunition and supplies, Garibaldi and his thousands, destined to become immortal in history, sailed from Genoa for Sicily. He's an outlaw and a cutthroat. He's a pirate. Those who follow him are the dregs of the human race. Why was he not stopped? Fortunately, there is a regular force of more than 20,000 on Sicily to face him, and many more on the mainland. To King Victor Emmanuel, Garibaldi left a letter. My sovereign, I embark on a perilous enterprise, but I put confidence in God and in the courage and devotion of my companions. If I fail, I trust Italy and liberal Europe will not forget that it was undertaken from motives free from all egoism and entirely patriotic. With his thousand red shirts, Garibaldi shaped his course for Marsala on the island of Sicily. Yeah! They're welcoming us, my general. They're welcoming us. At Marsala, Garibaldi and his thousand went ashore to be received with acclaim by the people. The flame burned fiercely. Garibaldi's army swelled to 12,000 as he began his march on Palermo, the capital of Sicily. The heights of Catalafimi are strongly held by the Neapolitans, my general. We will storm them. Yes, sir. Your Majesty. Reports of the Sicilian campaign reached King Victor Emmanuel. Your Majesty, Garibaldi has taken Palermo. Against General Lanza? Yes, General Lanza surrendered after three days of fighting in the streets of Palermo. But General Lanza had 20,000 well-trained and well-equipped Neapolitan troops. He surrendered them all to Garibaldi. And Garibaldi is now driving across Sicily to the Straits of Messina. From King Victor Emmanuel and his statesmen, Garibaldi received orders not to cross the Straits and land on the mainland of Italy. But Garibaldi had had enough of kings and counselors. He landed at Melito and drove northward. Fortress after fortress fell before his onslaught. The retreating Neapolitans are leaving great stores of arms and ammunition and supplies behind them. Take them all. We will use them. We must not lose the momentum of our drive. King Ferdinand and his court have fled from Naples. Naples is ours. <laughs> the wonderment of the entire world, Garibaldi took Naples, the capital of the two Sicilies, less than four months after he had landed at Marsala. King Victor Emmanuel was now indeed king of all Italy. When King Victor Emmanuel came, Garibaldi went to meet him and led his red shirts in his acclamation. Garibaldi, Garibaldi, the king is ignoring you completely. He, he, he does not see me. But he has not even acknowledged that you... I... He's going to speak to me. I have come here to restore order. Your troops must be very weary. Mine are fresh. Your Majesty, I... he has slighted you, my general. How dare you? We will show Victor Emmanuel that we can crush him the same as we no, did no. the... No, no, no. Trust me. I shall do what is best. Victor Emmanuel, though he had been handed a nation by Garibaldi, could not at once appreciate the greatness of this indomitable warrior. When at last he did... He invited Garibaldi to ride by his side as he entered Naples. You 
shall be amply honored and rewarded, my dear Garibaldi. <laughs> When the shouting had died, and the Sicilies had been joined with the other parts of Italy ruled by Victor Emmanuel, the king summoned Garibaldi. He offered him the title Prince of Catalafini, the rank of marshal, the Grand Cross of the Annunziata, pension of 500,000 francs. Garibaldi declined them all. I have only one request to make of your majesty. I ask that my thousand red shirts shall never be forgotten and left to poverty. Then he went to his red shirts. You cannot leave us now, my general. We need you. Italy needs you. No. No. I shall go back to my island of Caprera, to the quiet of my hills and valleys. My general. My general. Thank you, my brothers in arms. You have done much with scant means in scant time. But more is yet to do. Farewell. And the flame blazed so that all the world was lighted with its deathless glow. Would you like to know more of the life and times of Garibaldi portrayed in the program you just heard? A handbook containing life stories of 13 great leaders in the struggle for human liberty has been prepared as an interesting supplement to the broadcast series. To obtain your copy, write for We Came This Way. Address your requests to Columbia University Press, Station J, New York 27, and enclose 25 cents in coin to cover costs of printing and mailing. Tonight's script was written by Arnold Marquis and directed by Norman Felton. The original music was composed by Emil Soderstrom and conducted by Joseph Galicchio. Clifton Utley was the narrator and the role of Garibaldi was played by Wilms Herbert. Other members of the cast were Sidney Brees, Helen Malone, Howard Hoffman, Jim Goss, Claire Baum, and Kurt Kupfer. This series is presented each week as a public service feature of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations. message that concerns all able-bodied men between the ages of 17 and 50. Today, the United States is engaged in the greatest transportation job in the history of the world. Millions of tons of cargo and troops must be transferred to the Pacific.